This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome into another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. It's Bill Bartholomew here with you. As today we look at an issue that is having a hyper-local impact here in the southern New England region and is something that is obviously a national and even global conversation, and that is the business of hospitals. And, of course, here in Rhode Island, we're going through the ongoing merger between Lifespan and Care New England. And look, this is one of those topics that, you know, it comes up, but the details, getting into the thick of it, is something that I personally think the average listener, even someone who is a a news-gathering individual, may not really think about the in-depth and broad implications of a massive hospital merger. So today we welcome Brian Alexander. He's an American culture writer who just spent the last two and a half years working on an outstanding book called The Hospital, Life, Death, and Dollars in a Small American Town. And this is a book that has received acclaim from National Press, USA Today's Five Books Not to Miss, The Washington Post, 10 Books to Read in March, Fortune's 11 Books to Read in March, and I'll read you the New York Times review right here, a portion of it. From the C-Suite's tension-filled strategic planning meetings to life-or-death moments at the bedside, Alexander nimbly and grippingly translate the Byzantine world of American health care into a real-life narrative with people you come to care about. So we get into the thick of, generally speaking, what's going on with the American hospital business, so to speak. We touch on things here in Rhode Island, like uh, Pawtucket Memorial Hospital, and of course the ongoing merger between Lifespan and Care New England and the role that Brown University will play in that and really, frankly, how that impacts you. You know, we kind of break it down to a very uh, simple and nuanced conversation, I think. And Brian does a tremendous job. He's just an outstanding journalist and author and has, has really become um, a national voice on this matter. So he was out in Los Angeles. I'm here in our Providence studios. And I think this was a really important conversation that we, you know, we should be having. We should be understanding exactly what's going on and exactly where we are when it comes to the business of hospitals. What sort of numbers, you know, what what percentage of GDP does the hospital industry make up here in the United States? You may be surprised, and we get into that and much more here on this episode. Folks, if you'd like to support the independent journalism, analysis, opinion, and entertainment that Bartholomew Town has become known for, well, there's a few ways you may do so. You may send a one-time donation to Venmo at Bill Bartholomew or become a sustaining member by joining our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Bartholomewtown, or just click the support link wherever you're listening right now. For as little as $3 per month, your contribution goes literally into the bedrock of this operation. That's patreon.com slash Bartholomewtown. Okay, let's get into it with Brian Alexander. You can find the book on Amazon or wherever you get books. It's The Hospital, and this is a big-time conversation that we've really got to be having here Um, and everywhere, frankly. And let's see what Brian has to say about how we may be able to get out of some of the situations that we're in right now with respect to our healthcare system in the United States. The state of healthcare right now in the United States, and specifically when it comes to really the business of healthcare, I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to at this point in time, and particularly when it comes to hospitals and how they function as an institution of, there's obviously a public service element there, but there's also a business element there. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and that's the essential conflict of, of the book is there's a mission to serve mankind, try to keep us healthy, save our lives when our lives need saving. But there's this other side, which is how do we earn money? How do we make a profit? Uh, and those are often in rather dramatic conflict. Uh, there's, there's this inherent conflict. And um, Americans are still, even now, really can't get our heads around the fact that healthcare in this country is indeed a gigantic industry. It's the largest part of the American gross domestic product. At about 19% of the entire economy is healthcare. It is, in fact, a business. Yeah, it's big business, and it it has the effect of, you know, if you zoom in on a hyper-local level, you're making business decisions about which facility should be opened which, or remain open, which facility should be closed. You know, these are things that are numbers on a spreadsheet in terms of 
conglomerates or in terms of, you know, the, the business side of things. But then from an individual perspective, we, we have a situation here in Rhode Island where in a municipality known as Pawtucket, which is uh, part of the urban core here, Pawtucket had a hospital memorial that was closed down by the state. And there really hasn't been a way to replace the care in that hyper local context. We saw this come to fruition big time with COVID-19 and a lack of primary care or even emergency care um, w- within any kind of reasonable distance of this municipality. As I write in the book, COVID-19, the whole pandemic, really um, laid bare all these fault lines. They've been building and building and building. We like to pretend maybe they're not there because it's scary to look at this stuff. And uh, the COVID virus forced us to realize what a sorry state things are in. Yeah, and it exposed so much about inequity in terms of access to healthcare from a transportation standpoint, from a from an, even a translation standpoint, a trust uh, of institution standpoint. And frankly, it shouldn't be all that shocking when we see the demographic breakdown by zip codes or other defining factors of who was most impacted by COVID-19 in terms of severe outcomes. That's exactly right. And, and you know, drawing the camera out to get an even bigger picture apart from healthcare, it, the pandemic really exposed once and for all the basic social and economic inequalities in this country. As you just pointed out, who was more likely to get sick to die of COVID-19? It was meatpacking plant workers. It was janitorial staff in hospitals. It was fast food people. It was um, our, what we call, we now like to call our essential workers. Yeah. Another way to describe them are low wage workers uh, who were really suffering from this. And even before the pandemic, low wage workers, people with lower educations, much more likely to lead uh, lives in poor health much likelier to die earlier, which is why in this country, we have counties where people live 20 years longer than people in other counties. That's entirely demographic driven. Yeah, that is, those are the types of statistics that to me, they're apolitical. You know, they should be in terms of American exceptionalism. I mean, zoom out to the global conversation and we see what's going on in the global South right now in India and Brazil and so forth. I mean, that is humanitarian stuff. And when it gets blurred with business and, and transactions and mergers and acquisitions, uh, that's a crossroads that you wonder if much like observing, you know, looking back on the Romans, if at some point people will look back and say, aha, that's where they started to go off the rails. The when they started to separate that humanitarian calling from big business. It's really, a, it's really a gut check moment mm. to say, who are we? Who, who do we think we are? What kind of lives do we think we should be leading? And how do we, if we believe that we should try to make things better for more people, how do we go about that? We've been kind of cruising along thinking, you know, I have this saying that uh, Americans often feel that cash equals virtue that if somebody's got a lot of money, they must be good people, they must be super smart, they must have done everything right. Um, We're learning the hard way that that is not true. And now we're forced to say, what is our obligation to our fellow man? And is it really um, the way to fulfill those obligations when it comes to something as basic as healthcare um, with a profit motive? Uh, I liken it to water. I mean, uh, I would think, I would hope that most Americans would feel that access to clean drinking water is a human right. It's a basic function of government, local government usually. Um, If we suddenly privatized all the water systems in this country and they operated on a profit motive, I think most Americans would feel like, hey, there's something wrong with that. And yet something as basic as healthcare, that's exactly what we do. Yeah, and and we'll get into how we can address this in just a moment here in Rhode Island right now, we're, we're in the midst of, uh, and frankly, this resonates on a regional basis, not only in Rhode Island, but, for, but throughout the entire Southern New England region, which really goes from Boston, arguably to just about New Haven, Connecticut. And 
we have a major hospital merger on the table right now, Care New England and Lifespan. And it's something that is seems inevitable that um, and they're going to be partnering with Brown University as well. This leaves only the, the, off the top of my head, only two hospitals, one South County Hospital, which is uh, unaffiliated with with these groups and, and Westerly Hospital, which is part of the Yale um, network. All but two of our hospitals will now be under the auspices of this same conglomerate uh, with massive affiliations in Boston. There's so much concern about the, the the loss of immediate care inside the state of Rhode Island that'll require people to go travel to Boston for care, or which frankly is not something you want to do even in good health if you can avoid right. it um, from right. a traffic perspective, logistics, but just from a as you say that access to care that should be a given in our society, given where we're at at this point in time. What should the average person know about these kinds of mega mergers that take place? with hospital conglomerates? They are very similar to other kinds of mergers and in other industries. And so think about what happens when you wind up with a regional or sometimes even national oligopoly. So the first thing that happens is those um, oligopolies have pricing power because where are you gonna go? Uh, economic research has shown this over and over again that when a hospital system comes to dominate a region, prices go up and quality of care either stays the same or actually goes down. So you, so you need that hospital competition in an area. When that goes away, and this has happened because consolidation is happening all over the United States uh, with hospitals, uh, when this happens, you wind up paying higher prices. So that sticks it to the employer who has uh, employee health plans. Um, insurance companies end up charging those uh, employers more because the health plans are now getting pressure from the big oligopoly or monopoly hospital system to say, hey, you want to uh, do a contract with our health system, you're going to have to reimburse us more money. So let's say Blue Cross says, oh, okay, I'll reimburse uh, that health system more money, but I got to make that up down uh, from my customers. So my employer plans are going to have to have higher premiums. That then gets passed on to the employees in the form of higher deductibles and higher employee share for the plans. This happens over and over and over again. It also happens with uh, the vertical integration, you know, remember your your college uh, economics and standard oil, right? Uh, so uh, hospital systems buy up medical practices. <clears throat> Very few doctors now are standalone individual docs working in their own practice. They actually are now being bought out by health systems and their job is to feed their patients into the health system. So that, that ends up costing more. And employment can actually go down. So imagine you have two hospitals and uh, an oligopoly comes in, takes over a hospital. They don't need duplicate uh, back office billing. They they may outsource their janitors. They may outsource their food service workers. So you might actually have job losses. What other examples around the country come to mind of these major mega mergers that might be a good comparison to what's happening here in, in Southern New England? Well, uh, in Northern California, you have Sutter Health. Uh, So Sutter Health is a giant health system. uh, And as a result of their domination in Northern California, uh, somebody who has a a heart attack, uh, compare two people, have the exact same heart attack, the exact same symptoms in Northern California and in the Los Angeles area, they can pay up to $15,000 more in the Northern California market than in the Southern California market. Um, In the book that I write, uh, The Hospital, uh, the big health system that's based in Toledo, Ohio, ProMedica, uh, their charges are higher than the tiny community hospital that I write about, which is located in the small town of Bryan, Ohio, because they dominate the market, which is why the Federal Trade Commission, in a very rare move, prevented ProMedica from taking over another community hospital. They would own so much of the market 
that it was considered uh, a monopoly. And so antitrust came in and um, uh, um, made them stop that merger. Now that happens very rarely. When we come back, we'll continue this discussion on solutions. Where do we go from here? What what does the future look like for the healthcare industry? And is there going to be a point where the bubble bursts and we have to kind of reset to where things used to be, so to speak, or maybe where they should be? You're listening to the Bartholomew Town Podcast, Rhode Island's podcast of record, back after this. All right, folks, this is getting real. The time for talk is over. From iron workers to engineers, business owners to biology teachers, Rhode Islanders believe in the power of offshore wind. Together, we're cleaning the air and creating jobs right here at home. Our goal of 100% renewables by 2030 is in sight, and the future is bright with Rhode Island a real leader in America's emerging offshore wind industry. So what makes you a Revolution Wind believer? Join us at revolution-wind.com slash it's real. That's revolution-wind.com slash it's real. Let's go. If you're planning to get a COVID-19 vaccine, there are three ways to make that happen in Rhode Island. You can choose a state-run vaccination site, a regional or community-based clinic, or certain pharmacy locations. To learn more about all of these options, start at c19vaccineri.org. There, you'll find all the information and links you need to make a decision and to schedule an appointment. That's c19vaccineri.org. So what are some of the solutions for addressing this? I mean, there, there's obviously the, the notion of protest. There's obviously scrutiny from, from antitrust and uh, secretaries of state and attorneys general, so on and so forth. But really, how do we move forward in this well, broad at, at conversation? At the moment, you have hit on the tools, which is um, uh, the state AG is the attorneys general, uh, the state secretary of states at the state level, and then at the national level, the Federal Trade Commission and antitrust. Antitrust enforcement has been very weak when it comes to healthcare mergers. Uh, but that those are the tools we have right now, unfortunately. Um, the future looks like more consolidation. I wrote a, an op-ed for the Boston Globe where I talked about Amazon. Amazon is getting into the healthcare business. Um, if you want to have a picture of what the future of healthcare could look like, uh, just look at what Amazon is doing to retailing all over this country uh, at the moment. Uh, is that what we want? If it's not what we want, uh, then people are going to have to start paying attention. Uh, and I get why um, people sort of their eyes glaze over with this stuff. It's outrageously complicated. Uh, it takes a lot of sort of reading and self-education um, to be able to write a good letter to your secretary of state or, or AG. But I suggest that actually people start to do that. Ultimately, in the long term, it is my view after spending two and a half years reporting and then writing the hospital that we have to blow the whole system up and start all over again. Now, in a realistic way, do I think that's going to happen? Probably not. Uh, I wish it would. I think that ultimately we have to have some sort of national health plan. We have to have some sort of price control. Uh, just yes, last night, last night, I paid $250 for a teeny tiny little bottle of an eye drop of a really old off patent drug. Yikes. That's out. That's ridiculous. It should cost me about 10 bucks. Yeah. Uh, so we, the, the only way out of this is to say that we've so messed it up over a period of a hundred years, we have to tear the whole structure down and start all over again. Such an uphill battle. Um, one thing that we've heard from, from some medical doctors here in this region during the pandemic was the need for brick and mortar facilities in communities that are most I guess out of uh, out of connection with hospitals, major hospitals, independent brick and mortar facilities. 
um, small clinics, if you will, that become essentially micro hospitals in certain communities. Is that realistic yeah, or would that, that just that get is, gobbled that, up? You know, that's actually a, a great idea and a, and a really good point. So uh, I'm most familiar with Ohio because that's where the hospital is set. But I, I think this is true all over the country. If you were to drive down, there's a state route there, uh, Route 33, that goes north-south. And if you go to Delaware County, Ohio, which is just on the outskirts of Columbus, you can see, for a period of about two miles, you can see hospitals, clinics, doctor's offices, dentist's offices, chock-a-block right next to each other. Then you get into inner city Columbus and you see the giant empty property where a giant hospital was torn down. What happened there? Well, healthcare businesses, because that's what they are, whether they call themselves nonprofit or not, hospital businesses are chasing the money. So they're going out to suburbs where people have lots of private insurance and good insurance, and they're getting these big reimbursements, and they are abandoning cities and poorer areas. The facilities that are left in that gap often are what are called federally qualified health centers, the kinds of sliding scale um, um, facilities that may have a doctor, some nurse practitioners, sometimes a dentist, which is a big under uh, underappreciated need in this country is good mm -hmm. dental care. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are trying to step into that gap. Uh, much, much more of that should be done uh, because, uh, as we just spoke at the top of the program, who is really suffering in the pandemic, for example, and that is these underserved, poorer working class communities. And they are underserved health wise because they are often on Medicaid and Medicare, and Medicaid and Medicare reimburse at a lower rate, and hospitals want no part of that. They want to go where the money is. Yeah, and that just sums it up right there, that statement, where the money is. It's sad but true. What about from a, from a national political conversation? You know, we look back at the, the most recent presidential election where, you know, you, you, you have the range of Bernie Sanders through, um, you know, I guess Donald Trump, really, in terms of how to approach health care. How can everyone get on the same page with addressing this issue? Is there a common point, a crossroads, if you will, that we should be alerting people of? You know, uh, there may be, and, and it may be, it, it, it may be more possible than even I thought. And, and I'll tell you a quick story. So, Williams County, Ohio, where the hospital is based, very conservative county, mostly rural, uh, with small manufacturing as the basis of the economy and healthcare. The hospital is the largest employer in the town. Uh, and so I went to this conservative area that went almost 70% for Donald Trump in the last election. And I went to CEOs of these little manufacturing companies. And I said, hypothetically, let's say that I'm the government and I come to you and I say, I've got good news and bad news. The, the bad news is I'm going to raise your taxes. However, the good news is you are never going to have to pay another dime for an employee health insurance program. You're not going to have to administer that program and deal with all that paperwork and all that hassle. There'll be no more conversation about that. You can put that money into whatever you wanna put it into, R&D, new tools, new equipment, new employees, whatever you want. Um, but the trade-off is you're gonna pay some higher taxes. Would you take that deal? And two out of three said, in a heartbeat, now, this is not a socialist paradise in Williams County, Ohio. Okay, mm -hmm. These are Trump people, mainly. Uh, they want this off their back. And if you can convince people that every insurance premium they pay, every deductible they pay is already a tax, they might be willing to say, you know what, maybe we can take this off our shoulders and make this, God forbid I use the word, a socialized enterprise that all Americans are part of. Yeah, it's it's such an obvious move from my perspective that you know, I don't I don't know how we've gotten here. You know what I mean? It's it's one of those where you look at it and you go, "Boy, this is this is unsustainable from a human standpoint." And it's yeah, an injustice. I, I have a I have a woman who runs an insurance agency in the town. Um again, not a wildly liberal place. 
Uh, and her business is selling insurance and creating health insurance packages for businesses. And she looked across the table at me and she said, um, she said, this is unsustainable. Yeah, it certainly seems as such, you know, no doubt about it. Um, look, where can people find more info about you, find the book and kind of get, get, uh, get more in depth in this conversation? Um, well, the book's available everywhere. Um, I have, you know, my own author website, which is uh, uh, brianralexander.com. I'm on Twitter. People can go yell at me on Twitter if they want to yell at me on Twitter. Um, it, but the book's available everywhere. I, I would strongly urge, if you're interested in this issue, not only about healthcare, but really about how the the social and economic inequality and disparities in our country drive people to need health care in the first place. This is really what the book's about. I've spent my last five years covering and writing about this topic. My previous book was Glass House, which was what happens to a small town when Wall Street private equity comes in and takes over the largest employer, in this case, a manufacturer in the town. Uh, and what are the consequences of that happening? Uh, and they are, they are dire. Large parts of our country, as we have seen, um, have really lived through 40 years of tremendous economic and social erosion. And the result is what we have seen with Donald Trump and all those events. Uh, Trump is not a cause. Trump is a symptom. And uh, this, this healthcare issue is part of this pathology that we're all dealing with. Rhode Island's podcast of record. B-Town. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com slash employers.